Okay, folks, here we are. We're back. We're ready to go for round two, except for those of you that are newly joining us. I do know that we have about 15 extra students that were in um, Structures 1 that are in Structures 2. Um, for you guys, I recommend if you want, you can see all of the Lecture 1 um, videos. They've been posted um, to YouTube, so you can just kind of go back through my channel and uh, see what what videos are posted there. Um, we're going to do a little recap at the end of this. The hope is that if you didn't do Structures 1, it's because you have all the information you needed to be able to get to this point. Um, it's not always clear to me, because I know there's some that aren't necessarily exempt. There's uh, something kooky about advanced placement in there as well. So um, if we come up against something, reach out to me and um, you can have access to slides, whatever. But like I said, the PowerPoint presentations are all there, which show the lecture slides as well. So you can see here that you see me in the bottom little corner and the, uh, the lecture slides um, off to the side here. Um, for those that weren't in Structures 1, uh, when we do math problems, I turn the camera down so you can see my hand writing out the question and I make the, uh, the slide that, or the portion of the screen that you can see as my video camera bigger. Um, I know most of you already know this, um, but I do have a two-year-old and four-year-old here all the time. We had made the choice in September to keep them home, um, mostly because we had the opportunity, uh, kind of fell into our lap to hire a nanny on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we thought the um, the, the kind of weekly pain of uh, having to look after the kids by ourselves a lot more um, would be worth it if schools were shut down. Um, and it seems like that has, in fact, been the case. Um, as of right now, my understanding is, is that our nanny is still allowed to come into the house for childcare, um, in spite of the most recent full-on um, stay-at-home orders. Um, there are some extra difficulties around this with our life, um, uh, just like trying to manage everything with two small kids running around. Um, you guys, last term, were super patient about that. I can't tell you how much that meant to me. Um, uh, obviously, you guys are a huge priority um, for me this term, um, but it is all about balance. Um, but that means that I'm understanding to you guys as well. Um, just try to keep me appraised. If something's going on, um, you just you have to let me know. What makes it hard is to find out later. Um, uh, there, everyone was very tolerant in, administ in the administration last term. Um, I think now that things are sorted out a little bit this term, they may be looking for, um, within reason, a certain amount of documentation for things. So, um, if something comes up, if you're having troubles or you're falling behind on something, you have to let me know so that we can try to set, get steps set in place. Um, but telling us after the fact is a lot harder. Um, so, nor uh, in Structures 1, I kind of show you guys some projects. Anyone who's new, um, you can look me up on the internet. There is another Shannon Hulchie out there who is a voice actor for um, anime. Um, that is not me, um, although she seems to have a really cool job as well. Um, so, um, my, uh, so, Lecture 1... The way my lectures always run is that we have um, kind of an intro slide um, and then um, a kind of wrap-up slide. So today's lecture, um, we are going to uh, just kind of reintroduce the information you need to know and how the course is going to work. Um, we are going to do, there is a note missing here, that we're going to do strength, stiffness, and stability again. In fact, I'm going to add that into... You'll often see me write notes that I add to improve into the lecture slides for you guys. So you won't see it right here, but you will see what we're going to talk about today, which you guys have heard many times, um, is that we're going to go through strength, stiffness, and stability. More just as a reminder of the important things we're worried about as engineers. 
Um, and then we are going to do a review. This whole slide, it's almost like I have the wrong one open. Um, I'm going to fix the opening slide. So slide two is crap. So you guys will see a slightly different slide two when you're following along with this. Um, so I'll just straighten that up. It doesn't really have much of an impact on you guys. Okay, so the course is going to be laid out almost the exact same as Structures 1, hopefully a little bit better because we've worked through a lot of the technical challenges on how Quercus works. I have found a way that in some types of questions on Quercus, I can do um, um, rich-based text um, um, editing, so we can do Greek letters and superscripts, but it's not all types of Quercus answers. It's, uh, it's a crapshoot. They had it, it disappeared for a long time, and now it's back, apparently, from what I was able to find when I dove deep into um, Canvas research. So, assignments are worth 30% of the mark. There is 10 of them in the first 10 weeks. The last two, I will give you assignments that won't be marked. The idea there is that normally the last two weeks um, is a blackout period, or they asked me to make that a blackout period for assigned work, but there's important information that I think you guys should be able to practice kind of when you want and how you want. So I've made fake assignments for those where I give you guys the answers and you can go through it and kind of work through it, but see the answers right away. Um, and so that won't be submitted work that needs to be marked. The assignments are found on Quercus the day of class. Um, they, you have the whole week to work on it. Um, it is due at Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Um, if you're only half done it at that point, it will submit it at that stage. So um, uh, try to get it submitted before that so it doesn't auto-submit on you. Uh, there's no time limit. Um, submit only once it's completed. Take time. I have noticed um, when I kind of peruse uh, individual marks, it does show me how long people spent on the assignment, and people that spent a short time on it tend, not always, but tend to do worse on the assignments. Um, so those people that take some time and think about it, you guys are allowed to communicate with each other, you're allowed to talk to each other. Um, it shouldn't be, hey, what's the answer to this question? Um, although the only person that's going to suffer for that is you. Um, so try your hardest, talk about it, work through it. Um, there's a discussions page where you guys can start internal forums. You guys probably have your own um, a page somewhere in some platform, uh, maybe it's in Meets or something else where you guys do communicate. So you guys are allowed to have discussions there. Um, try to submit questions to the TAs uh, before like four o'clock on Tuesday because they have their own commitments as well and you want to give them time to kind of look at the, the question and answer it for you or see what they can do to help you out. Um, all the assignments have an equal weight of 3% for the term. You're going to see that they all have different values on Quercus. Don't worry about that. I turn it into a 3%. I turn it into something out of 3% for each one. So at the end of the term, I download the Quercus data and import it into my uh, Excel sheet um, so that I can standardize it and, and um, create stuff that includes the exams and projects. Uh, that I can submit to the administration to document all of um, your marking. So it's not just arbitrary. There is a documented sheet. Um, I'm not allowed to share it with you, uh, but I do have to share it with the administration. If you cannot meet a due date, you have to let us know. Um, and not after it's due, but before it's due. We try to be very, very, very understanding. Um, obviously, if a pattern develops, there's less I can do about that, but I am very understanding. You just have to keep me informed. Uh, the project. The project is due the last day of the semester, and that is set by the director. It's a project of two parts. Um, it used to just be that you had to create structural drawings of your studio project, and then you had to pick a certain amount of elements to design. What I found there is that it wasn't really fair across the board because some people um, picked very simple members, some people picked very hard members. Uh, it became very hard to standardize marking across that. So if somebody picks a very hard one but doesn't do very good, is that worth more or less than somebody picks 
something very simple and does it pretty well. Um, so what I've done is turned it into two parts. Part one, um, you do with your studio partner. If you do not have a studio partner in structures, don't worry about it. There are arrangements for that. And if you read the outline for the project, which I don't think is posted yet, but it will be very soon, there is an outline for people with non-studio partners. Uh, part two, everybody does individually. I create um, a project and drawings for you, and I assign particular members that you have to design. Um, uh, the studio dates have been organized. Um, you're going to... Um, Normally, uh, I knew most of the engineers that would be coming in for that. Um, Sam has a lot of experience um, in other cities, so he's bringing in engineers from around the world. Um, I think quite a few from New York, too. So, um, I don't necessarily know all of those engineers personally. Um, I will try to ensure that they have all of the sizing guidelines. Um, um, they might know, might not know the message that we're trying to drive home on some of this, um, because sometimes you have questions very specifically for studio, and sometimes you have questions that are kind of geared more to the structural course aspect of your studio project. So um, just bear that in mind when you're talking to um, the engineers that you're going to get to communicate with for the kind of desk crits uh, in, within studio. Uh, the exam, again, not everyone gets the same questions, but the difficulty level is the same. So, you know, slightly different versions of the same question just to allow, um, you know, the administration has asked us to limit cheating. I mean, it's an open book exam done on a computer where I can't see you guys. If you're going to cheat, you're going to cheat. I can't, I, you know, at the only, again, the only person that's going to suffer for that is you. You will ultimately pay for the price for that at some point. Um, I care about you knowing the answer. Um, so, you know, I've tried to do what I can to make it hard to cheat. I'd prefer, I'd, if studying and looking up the answer in um, the slideshows is easier than cheating, then I think I've done my job. And so that's what I've tried to do is just make it that much, just make it one step easier so that actually just doing the work is the easier way to go about it. Um, most of you have had experience with this. We do multiple different types of questions. Again, open book. You guys have seen my style on um, Quercus exams for the most part now. Um, I, I like questions that are from lists in the lectures. That's a, a very, and uh, equations, m more equations this term um, uh, because we're actually looking at specific material codes that have lots of equations in them. So the classes, um, I will post a PowerPoint and then a link to the video like this and post it in Quercus, which if you're watching this, you've probably already gone through that process. The first slide will always have the outline of the lecture and learning points. The last slide will list the important items that I feel I covered in that lecture. Uh, PowerPoint and video will be posted by Wednesday each week. I think I was pretty consistent with that last term. I think there was two days where I posted it on Thursday. One of them was that god-awful day where I recorded six and a half hours of lectures between the three courses with no mic, um, and it wasn't clear because I could see the mic bar moving, which, oddly enough, something has happened that that doesn't show up now, but I've tested and checked, and there is sound, so I don't know what the F is going on. Um, I will do my best. Um, I've tried to set up a schedule that allows me to get everything uploaded by Wednesday. Worst case, it would be Thursday or something absolutely bonkers has happened. Um, if things get worse in Ontario, um, and somehow I'm ordered that I'm not allowed to have the nanny in my house, I will cry a lot, obviously, uh, and we'll have to, it, that'll be... I don't know. Uh, I don't. Know. I can't. I can't even think about that because I don't want that to happen so badly. Um, I am teaching another course at this time, um, so it's hopefully better than uh, last term where I was teaching three lecture-based courses. One of them a brand new course, um, and two of them being converted on. So all three on Quercus. One of them being brand new, never taught before. 
This term is a little bit easier, where I'm teaching two of them. Um, one of them is structures one in the new format where uh, uh, the students do structures one in year one. Um, so they are all getting the benefit of the fact that most of the Quercus flaws were worked out last term. So hopefully that makes a life a lot easier. Um, I do have two absolutely bonkers size projects that went into construction over Christmas. Um, one of them I got the heads up in early November, the other one I just got the heads up recently. Um, I was not expecting this, um, but uh, the government has said municipal projects are super important to keeping the economy going, um, and uh, not only are they important and should continue to be under construction, they should be accelerated to get money out into uh, the world. Um, that means that, uh, and one of them is a renovation of a very complicated building um, that as much as we think we know the answers, we already know that the existing drawings are absolute crap. Um, so there are going to be surprises every single day on that project. So uh, we'll, we're gonna work it out as we go, is basically what I'm saying. Um, the TAs um, are there to help you answer questions um, for the assignment and general work. Uh, try to submit questions to them um, within the week, preferably before the due date so they have time to review it. Uh, if what they're going to do is keep a list of the questions and if we see questions that would benefit the whole class, I will send an email out to the entire class. You guys saw me do that uh, a few times last term. There were some weeks with no real questions that went out. One of the things that uh, the feedback I got last term where there was some students that would have really liked some assigned TA time. Um, uh, I mean, like I said, we had questions, we had weeks with no questions to the TAs. Um, but what we've done is uh, the TAs have posted times that they will be available um, uh, at different times. That's a set time that you can call in to a Zoom call. The idea being there that there are some students that might not um, be comfortable taking the initiative on their own, but this allows a platform for them to even listen in to other questions or um, kind of ask a question one-on-one -on -one where they can see someone over a video call. Again, the TAs are going to try to track those questions because if a good question comes up, we definitely want to make sure that the entire class benefits. Um, try to start with TAs for asking questions. They should be your first resource. Um, uh, if they don't answer in a few hours, give them a break. They're trying hard too. They have all kinds of commitments just like you and I. Um, uh, and if they, and remember, they are not engineers. They are uh, people who have gone through my course and probably did better than average, but they will not have all the answers, nor should they or be expected to have all the answers. But they might be able to head you down the right path. Um, if they cannot answer the question, they will make sure the question gets to me, so do not worry about that. Again, uh, this says there's 70 of you, but I think there's more like 90 of you, and my other class has 70 students, um, and you're all graduate students kind of working intensely this term. So um, you've got to start with the TAs. If the TAs can can filter out um, even half of the questions that make it to me, that would be huge. Um, uh, definitely list what class you're in uh, when you're emailing me because it's not always apparent to me by, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm confused by assignment two, question five. I won't know what, what class that is unless you tell me. Um, and again, two-year-old, four-year-old, Uh, comprehensive Studio. Um, this class is part of Comprehensive Studio. Uh, the review days have been organized with structural guests to help move your studio project forward. Again, I didn't coordinate that all this term. Uh, I cannot personally meet with every group. It is just simply not possible, um, nor budgeted in the time or fee that the University have given, has given me. As much as it is tied to Comprehensive, my mandate is that the project for the structural submittal is what's tied to it. Um, I volunteer my time for those um, um, comprehensive course review dates. Um, I don't get any funding for that. The other other teacher or the other uh, guest crits do. 
um, but I volunteer my time for that. Um, I want to help you guys, um, but again, let's let's try to talk to the engineer that's there on that day. I think there's three days that you get that. Um, and then we have TAs, and then definitely feel free to kind of submit a question to me. Um, this isn't me trying to be a jerk. Um, it's just that the, the, the commitment is, is insane to try to do that. Um, part one of the project, like I said, is tied to your comprehensive project, and in the next week or two, I will post the project outline for you. So my job, you've seen this slide before, uh, is to, be, to meet the requirements set out in the class lesson plan, to meet the needs of the majority of the class. Um, that means that if you um, uh, excel in math, maybe you have an engineering degree, you might not find this class that challenging. Um, if you want to be more challenged, that's kind of going to be up to you to find deeper resources or really kind of push those boundaries. If you struggle mathematically, I want to see you do well, um, but the course outline is set. It's mandated by um, accreditation. We've been reviewed, and this is what we have to do. Um, I can't make it less complicated. I can try to make it as clear as I can, but the information is there and set. Um, if you think you struggle with math or complex um, kind of mathematical understanding, you should try to find a tutor. The TAs are not meant to be your tutor. They're meant to be a resource to ask basic questions to or clarification or understanding of the coursework. Um, they cannot spend, you know, an hour a week focused on one person. Um, uh, if you think you need that kind of attention, definitely try to find a tutor that can help you out with that. Um, and then the last one is to be reasonably available. Um, like I said, my hours are absolutely wonky. I am not going to have a set time throughout the week that I'm available. Um, but submit your questions. You'll probably find that I, I reply very quickly. Um, and if I don't reply to you personally, I'll say, great question, uh, class email to follow, something like that. Um, uh, mostly because sometimes I'm doing this stuff in the middle of the night, um, and I, 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 I can't I can't set the time where I have like focused time with you guys. Mostly because my husband Dave and I are fighting for the quiet room. He's hiding upstairs in the nursery right now, taking a conference call so that I can have this room to record this lecture. So. And then we, again, we have Malcolm doing online school in another room with the two-year-old running around. So, uh, you know, trying to find quiet time to be able to talk to anyone is almost impossible. All right, the TA's job, to have a pretty good understanding of the concepts. They need to be reasonably available. Um, and they're going to provide two-hour time slots of a set availability weekly. They will try to respond to emails within a few days. It might not be instantaneous. Give them a cut them some slack. They're under the same pressures and demands you guys are. Uh, and I've already said this, they're not practicing structural engineers. They will not have all the answers, but start with them. They're probably people that have a really good understanding of, in fact, I know that they are students that had a really good understanding of this course. Um, uh, and mostly they can try to filter out some of the confusion at least. Your job. Uh, watch the lectures, complete the work that's outlined, and study for the exam. Um, try to take some notes on the side if you think that's helpful, but the slides are available and the videos are available, which is kind of fantastic in a way that they weren't before. Um, my hot tip, especially for studying for the exam, is to pretend it's not open book while you're studying um, and keep a cheat sheet almost that writes out all of the lists and equations and anywhere where I say uh, this would make a great exam question. Um, uh, and then you'll probably have most of the information you need for the exam already there in a handy little couple page set of things for you. I talked about this last term. Why is there no textbook? I would love there to be a textbook and um, I'm working on it with the CWC, that is the Wood Council, but they wanted kind of a, a comprehensive intro to structural engineering for architectures embedded in that. Um, I've written most of it, 
um, uh, I have like two small chapters left to write. They seem to be stuck in a bit of a holding pattern. The person who was running it um, had a baby in September, and so you can imagine having a baby in COVID um, makes it kind of insane. So I think they are uh, a couple months behind uh, their production schedule on that, um, but editing, my guess, is going to be happening throughout the spring. The books that we need to work with are listed here. Um, and I simply do not think it's reasonable for you guys to buy all of those when we only need a few pages out of each of the books. Um, and most of them, or half of them, are American anyway and not fully applicable to us. So any of the examples in um, the Hibbler books would not be um, in the Canadian code anyway. So um, they're great for kind of understanding the, the, the information around statics or di not dynamics because we want statics. Um, but the uh, often in imperial units and um, their codes are slightly different. So their factors are slightly different, their load factors, um, their reduction factors are slightly different. Um, we're going to see when we get into um, the wood and steel and concrete stuff, their equations are slightly different. They're ultimately doing the same thing, but their equations are just set up slightly differently. So, um, you know, if we use those, I'd have to, I'd spend half of my time telling you what is not applicable. Um, so what I've done is I've created my own questions, essentially. Uh, if you are a person that likes more examples, and we have a lot of them, so uh, you know, definitely enough to meet the demands of this course, but if you want more questions, so say you were struggling on um, the concept of static equilibrium, um, you could Google static equilibrium uh, questions, and you would probably find things on the internet that could help you out. Um, again, what we have in the course is more than enough for probably 90% of you to meet the requirements of this course. Um, anyone else is somebody who really truly likes more problems. And I get it, I understand. I like lots of problems as well. Um, but we have enough here in the course, in my opinion, and the opinion of I've had this reviewed by you know, people that teach this program and other, and other universities as well, and accreditation, that we have the minimum that we need, more than the minimum of what we need for this course. Um, again, though, online resources. Um, I know if you, if you prefer another voice, there is um, uh, Arc Daily. This comes around every couple years. Um, there is a gentleman who has recorded a series of videos teaching structural engineering to architects to help the Americans study for their um, exams. Um, the, just the clause there though that it is American, so some of the codes are different, the general concepts are the same. Um, they broke it up into separate kind of, uh, I've done, uh, I've set up the course so that we learn all about the loading side and then all about the, um, kind of uh, materiality side in a separate course. They've mixed it up slightly where they focus just on certain elements and go through the whole process. Um, I find this method clearer and it kind of breaks it down into very kind of two defined concepts. Um, but if, if, feel free to take a look at, um, at those videos if you find it helpful. Some people do and I, I totally understand. Um, <laughs> this is, um, some of this falls out of, um, um, project submittals in past years. Um, uh, read the directions. Um, what I am expecting of you is listed in the outline of the project. Uh, take a look at that and see what it says. Uh, so you should complete all the outline tasks. If you don't do one whole step and I have points assigned to that, I cannot give you the step. If you did it wrong, I can give you still a good chunk of the marks because I can point out I can take a look and see what you did, but if you did nothing, I can't give you the marks. So please just do all the outlined work and then I can give you so many points, so many points. Um, assemble the documents in order and right side up. Make sure that it's an easy to kind of flow through PDF. Uh, make sure the whole page is captured. If you're scanning it, 
from something, make sure you take a look at it and see what it looks like when you open it up. If half of the work is off the page, I can't mark that work. Uh, your name should be on it somewhere. Um, and make sure it's something you'd like to mark. Um, if it looks like just a bunch of scribbles, you can imagine how hard it is for me to assign points to things if I can't even see what I'm looking at. If I zoom in and I can't make out the text, I can't mark it. It's really hard to mark. I might be able to infer some of it and do the best I can to give you marks. Um, but if you can't see it, how could I possibly see it? Um, so don't scribble. Uh, one year somebody wrote their project on the back of a cell phone bill and you could literally see it bleeding through the page. Like I could see their cell phone bill information more than I could see the work that they had written out. Um, somebody one year put their name on two different projects. I don't even understand that. Um, I will say that you guys last term, pretty good. There was um, a lot of good work put into the projects that you guys did last term. Um, one of the better years, I think. So, uh, I talked about this last term. Why are you guys doing structural engineering in your architecture program? Why would you bother? Well, you guys do a lot of the engineering work before there's even an engineer on board. You usually pick out what material you're building your building out of, and so you need to know why. Why would you pick certain materials for certain projects? Um, we talked about most of that in Structures 1. You do a preliminary layout, which means you need to know what makes sense for spans for different materials. Uh, and you often will do a set of drawings that have preliminary sizes on it, um, and that comes with sizing guidelines. Um, for those of you that didn't do Structures 1, my sizing guidelines are posted in the Downloads module of Quercus. Um, those should be uh, a, a thing that you have handy at all times. Uh, and you need to understand um, limits to materials. So that's all the stuff that you almost always need to do before you even hire an engineer. And then once the engineer is involved, you need to understand what making changes does. So you need to understand the limits of materials. You should understand whether changing depth or width has more of an impact on something. What happens if I make all of my beams longer? So change the grid spacing on something. What will be the impact on the project? Is my, does my former solution work anymore? Um, so those are all things you have to have a feel for. So again, they're difficult concepts with difficult math, and you'll need to do the math a few times to understand the concepts. Um, I try to do two or three examples of most things, whether it is um, two examples in the lecture and then a third one as an assignment that you have to kind of work through the process yourself, but you have time, you have the luxury, and then obviously you will have exam questions. So in Structures 1, um, you guys learn to create the system. You learn to do a preliminary design. So we looked at sizing guidelines for different materials, um, and once you've done your layout, you could assign preliminary sizes to most things. We talked about loads, what types of loads are on a building, and how we calculate them if they're things that we needed to calculate. We talked about how the loads move through the building. You know, you put snow on a roof deck, the roof deck spans to joists or purlins, the joists or purlins span to beams, those beams span to girders or columns, if not those girders transfer to columns, and then those columns run down through the building to our foundations, and then our foundations transfer our loads out into the soil. And we went through all of those steps. Then we looked at, at each of those segments, what, are the, what do those loads do to that element? So what is the shear, what is the axial, what is the bending moment on each of those elements? And then we looked at what the allowable deflection on those elements were as well. This term, we are going to design and size the members for those loads. We are going to make sure the reduced capacity is greater than all of those factored loads on the elements we determined last term. So that seems pretty easy. Just design and size the members, no big deal. But this is where all of the concepts are going to come together. So 
At the beginning of this course, we're going to spend some time talking about how we figure out what happens to materials. And then we're going to spend some time talking about each material and designing in each material and what it means. So remember, the number one goal of what we're doing is to find the cheapest section that works. Now, cheap does not mean ugly. Cheap does not mean bad. Cheap just means that once we have satisfied strength and stiffness and stability requirements and any other criteria we have, which could include design criteria, so architectural considerations can be part of that, once we've met all those criteria, what is the cheapest section that's available? So in structures one, I'm, I'm just a little bit cold and I want to turn up the heat. Oh, the heat is up. Alright, I'm going to get a blanket then. Sorry guys. I'm just a little bit chilly. Um, so, um, in Structures 1, we talked about sizing guidelines, and remember, they are just a guideline. They are not the absolute limit of what the size is. You are not saying a W310 by 39 works. You are saying a W310 is a good choice of steel beam or purlin or girder in that situation. You cannot possibly know if a W310 by 39 is the right beam or not. But you do know that a W310 is probably a good place to start if your beam is so long fulfilling this particular job. It is always about standard members in ideal conditions. So if you have something unusual happening, happening like um, last term I talked a lot about the gold ring building, um, if you have an MRI sitting on it, maybe your criteria are outside of the normal conditions. Um, if it seems too small, it probably is. Everything you need to know about structural engineering, you probably already know, or your gut feel is pretty darn good about it. If it looks like it doesn't work, it probably doesn't work. Um, the sizing guidelines work both ways. If you know the depth, maybe it's set by the ceiling height, you can figure out the appropriate span. If you know the span, you can figure out an appropriate depth. They will still be overruled by the final design, but hopefully they're pretty darn close to the final design. So if you picked a W310, hopefully your final design is one of the steel members that is a W310, not a W530, because then you have a much deeper beam than you were expecting, and maybe your ceiling depth only allowed a W310, and now that is amplified over all 10 stories of your building, and we have an extra 200 plus millimeters, an extra 10 inches on each floor times 10. You know, now maybe, maybe our ultimate height of our building, we've exceeded it and we have to lose an entire story. And that is a very bad news situation to go back to the owner and say, um, once we did the, once the engineer did the final design, we have to knock a whole story off your building. So those preliminary sizing guidelines can be very important. In Structures 1, we also talked about loading. We talked about dead loads, and we broke it out into self-weight and superimposed. We talked about live loads, which could be people and the things in the building. And over large areas, we can reduce it sometimes with a live load reduction factor. The idea there being that as the area gets bigger and bigger, the odds of it all seeing that maximum load at the exact same time goes down. So that's about statistical probability of the maximum load over the entire area at the same time. And that's why we only apply the live load reduction factor for areas of a certain size or bigger. Snow, we talked about calculating snow for a 1 in 50 year event. And we talked about a calculating wind for a 1 in 50 year event. We talked about earthquake being um, a function of um, gravity weight. Um, and in Toronto, uh, Southern Ontario-ish, it tends to be between, you know, 12 and 25%, depending on your soils condition. You can have places like California, Northern Quebec, Vancouver, where the percentage of load might actually be greater than 
the gravity load itself. It could be 110%. You have more load pushing sideways due to the earthquake than you did pushing downwards. Um, and in those zones, seismic design is of much more importance. It's always important, but it can have a much bigger impact on the design. Um, we talked about soil pressure, uh, what soil does to a building. Uh, we talked about temperature briefly, um, pre-stress and vibration. Less important for what we've been doing in our design, but we talked about them and kind of um, introduced the concept of those load types. Um, I'm going to go through again now, and I'm just going to check that, yeah, I'm going to do the strength, stiffness, and stability lecture that we did last term again. Um, not because I'm boring and not original, but I find it a really good refresher uh, to just reintroduce the things that, or basically why, what we're talking about and what we're looking at. So these are the three things that every, three, three things that every engineer has to look at for every connection, every element, and every system in a building. We have to look at strength, we have to look at stiffness, and we have to look at stability. Stability is often, um, either we intuitively understand it, or we draw a drawing to get our head around it. Uh, stiffness is um, the force required to make a structure deflect by some fixed increment. It is not about life safety. It is usually about preserving finishes or the comfort of someone in our building. Strength is all about life safety. Is our element strong enough? Will it break? Will it fail? Will it cause destruction in some way? Um, these three things can be interrelated and tied to each other. One can have a trickle-down effect on the other. We can see um, doing one have an impact on the next one. So let's start with strength. Back in the day, we used to do factor of safety. We do not do factor of safety anymore. So if I say, what did we used to do? The answer is factor of safety. If I say, what do we do today? Well, you'll see that in just a minute, and you guys should already know that. What we used to do is say, so say I climbed up and sat on a table. The table has a weight, and Shannon, and the table has the weight of Shannon sitting on the table. Uh, we would want to make sure that that table wouldn't fail from its own weight and the weight of Shannon on it. So the capacity of it would have to be greater than the load. Well, what if Shannon went out and had a burger and beer and came back and sat on the table again, and we had designed it just to hold the weight of Shannon and the table? Well, now the table would fail. So that doesn't seem like a great, seems like a very fine way to design something. So what we used to do is say, okay, let's put a factor of safety on it. We know there's only going to be the weight of Shannon and the table there. Um, and we know she would probably only go out and have a turkey dinner or a burger or something like that. Maybe she put on her backpack with all her books and is sitting on the table now. But we're going to assign a factor of safety greater than that. And depending on what type of element it was designing, we were designing, we used to put a range of, um, you know, one and a half to three for soils. For members, it was three or four. Uh, for connections, it was four or five. Um, so you can imagine what we actually did back in the day is we said, okay, well, we want this table to hold up the weight of itself and Shannon, but we're going to multiply the weight of Shannon and the weight of table, the table by four. We're going to design this to actually hold four table weights and four Shannons on top of it and make sure the capacity is greater than that. The odd thing there, though, is, yeah, maybe there are four Shannons that get up on the table, but it doesn't seem realistic that there'd be four tables on the table um, for weight, not helping with strength in any way, shape, or form. So what we did is we lumped all the loads together, and we didn't kind of give them any differentiation. Um, what we do now is we break the loads out into different load types and apply different factors accordingly. So we still increase the load on the system. The other thing we do, so we do two things different now. We break out the loads, but we also say, well, 
you know, what if the table weighs a bit more, but what if they planed the table down a little too much and we don't have quite the capacity that we thought we did there? Or what if it was a weaker material than we expected? We also reduce the capacity of the material. So we increase the loads, but we increase them less than we used to. And we are smarter about how we increase the loads. And then on the other side of the equation, we reduce the capacity of the material. So we factor the loads, we reduce the capacity. We like to give everything Greek symbols. So we factor the loads and we reduce the capacity. And then, just so that it's easy for us to talk about it, if you see a subscript F, it means we've already applied that load factor. If you see a subscript R, it means we've already applied that reduction factor, or we've reduced the capacity of the material. This is called limit state design. So that is the method of design we do now here in Canada and the majority of the world. We factor up the load depending on what type of load it is, and we reduce the capacity, and it's different depending on what type of material it is and what the material is doing. And then we make sure that the reduced capacity is greater than the factored load on it. And we do that for all the different types of load our object might see. So I'm going to take out my handy dandy, very weird foam block here. Um, we, and this is the fisheye lens, is a total pain in the butt for this, but we can have compression where we squash it. You can see all my little blocks kind of squishing a little bit. We can have tension. It's hard to get a grip on this to pull. So compression, shortening a member, tension, lengthening a member. And that's going to be important when we talk about stress and strain in a few lectures. Shear. Shear is what happens on the plane of an element as we try to shift two sides past each other. But we don't care just about this one plane. We care about the plane right beside it, and the plane right beside that, and the plane right beside that, and the plane right beside that, until we can almost talk about these two planes on an infinite amount of planes distant from each other. For those of you that like math, you'll understand that concept as calculus. Don't get scared. We don't actually do any calculus. We've gone through and figured out how to talk about structural engineering using very little calculus. We do use it for something, but you guys aren't going to have to go through that process. But that is the concept behind um, shear. Um, I wasn't exactly a um, studious student when I was in school, and um, I had a tendency not to go to class. But I was very good at calculus. Um, and um, when I missed the lecture where we learned um, uh, WL squared divided by 8 and WL divided by 2 for shear and bending moment diagrams, um, and on my exam where we had to do it, I did it all by integration and solved it from first principles of calculus. Um, the way I know Dave and I are true soulmates is that um, when he took those courses a long time before me, uh, he, he did the same thing. He, he missed some key lectures and um, ended up doing it by for first principles from calculus as well. Um, so in that, we realized we are true soulmates. Um, I do not recommend you do it that way because we're not actually going to go into the calculus of it that much. Um, and I will give you the quick ways to do things ultimately. Um, so we have to learn the process. And then for almost everything, there is a quicker, easier way to do things. But we have to learn the process, and then I can show you the easy way to talk about it. Um, so shear, infinite amount of planes slipping past each other. Bending. As we bend something, we are putting one side in tension and one side in compression. You can actually see that these little, these little cubes are getting smaller at the top, and at the bottom, they're stretching out. And for those with a keen eye, you'll see that middle line, not much is happening to it at all. And that is going to be super duper important, I think, in lecture four, where we talk about stress and strain for bending. 
really, it looks like the important thing that's happening here is still tension and compression and some transition from compression on one side to tension on the other. I would like to note that if we bend this in the other direction, we get our compression on the bottom and our tension on the top. Torsion, again, we don't really do in this course, but it's super important to know that we worry about it when we do strength. And that's the act of twisting something like this. You can see that all of the lines I've drawn on this foam block start to warp and do fantastical things. It is essentially a slight combination of moment and shear um, in a torsional plane or about a plane. Um, we're not going to do any work on it, but I want you to hear the word torsion and understand that it exists. We also worry about connection design. Um, often we're worried about whether it's ductile or brittle, and we have to connect the, the elements for shear and axial forces and bending or torsion on local elements. So, this can be all well and good to meet all of those loads that are applied to it, but if it doesn't work for how it's connected to this column, doesn't mean a goddamn or a gosh darn thing because we're going to have a failure there. So, not only does the member have to work, it has to work for how it gets the loads to other things, which is why we often like simply supported beams because they don't have moments at the ends and moments are a total pain in the butt to connect for. So if we have a simply supported beam with no moment at the end, it is a lovely thing to connect for. We're just connecting for shear or possibly axial forces. So the best way to show most um, forces is to show it failing because that's a nice fun way to look at things and you can really see what we're talking about. Um, again, you've seen these images before um, so I'm just going to go through them very quickly so we have some time to do some examples from last term at the end of this lecture. So axial failures in compression. Here we have a concrete cylinder and a wood, a wood block that have been squashed so that they failed. If you notice, they're kind of small elements. If I had a, if I wanted to squash this foam, very easy to squash it. If I wanted to squash this foam, something really annoying happens. It tries to buckle. That bad boy starts to shift over to our stability issue. So we are going to talk about buckling when we get into column design for our different materials. But these little, these little samples right here are failing in strength. They are failing due to the compression load, not buckling. Axial failures for tension. This steel rod has been stretched until it fails. I wonder if I have an elastic band here. You can see we can stretch this. If I put little marks on this, you would see that each of those little marks would get longer and longer and longer, or more distant from each other. That's an interesting thing we're going to talk about next week as well. Shear failures. For those people that have a hard time understanding this concept of these infinite planes side by side by side, I like this image because it's very clear that it is a singular plane where we are shifting one side past each other and you can understand that the thing that is stopping these two things from sliding past each other is the bolt. And we are trying to push up on one side and pull down on the other and something is happening through that bolt. And you can see over here, this side is down here and this side is up here. If we cut these plates away, the bolt would be at a bit of a diagonal there. And you can see here in the concrete beam, that's what's essentially happened right here as well. This is a very good indication of a shear failure in a concrete beam. What we often do in concrete is put pieces of steel right along here so that that crack, when it hits it, stops when it hits that steel and cannot propagate any further. Shear failures in concrete and or masonry walls. These are due to lateral loads. We have two floors. This is the ground. This is the upper floor. We have a lateral load. So that's a load pushing sideways on something. 
Um, and this floor here is trying to shift relative to the one below. If the two floors were one on top of each other, we understand that those two things are slipping past each other. Well, when the load is up here, we're trying, we're talking about the infinite planes along the thing that is stopping those two things from shifting past each other. So these are shear walls. You can see this diagonal crack, classic indication of a shear failure. This one seems to only have the shear failure in one direction. This one seems to have it in both directions. Well, a windstorm would have big steady winds in one direction. I get it, tornadoes, hurricanes, but those don't often have um, a reversal on a whole building. A tornado is pretty localized, or the odds of one side of the tornado hitting and then the other side hitting in the same direction, moving in the same way, is highly unlikely. Um, uh, a hurricane may be more likely, but often the winds aren't the same on both sides. Um, uh, you know, my family, I'm from Nova Scotia, and you could even see in the way the trees were destroyed um, through Halifax uh, when Hurricane Juan came ashore in 2001. You could see what direction the wind was going by how the trees fell. They fell in different directions, um, but the clock speeds were different on each side. This one here, it looks like there was almost the exact same load in both directions, and that is an earthquake. An earthquake throws the object this way, and then throws the object this way, and then throws the object this way, and throws the object this way, almost with equivalent force. It might increase, it might decrease, but it's happening so fast that it is um, a very similar force in each direction. Bending failure, you can see they had a a, uh, a support right here and a support right here and then I'm gonna do it Ooh. what did I just do there we go sorry about that um, I'm gonna hold this here like this with as my uh, pin roller condition I'm gonna use my chin as the applied load and you can see that we've got uh, compression on the top and tension on the bottom and you can see that this wood failed in tension on the bottom due to the point load. It was two point loads in bending. If you look close, you can also see there's a little bit of squashing or compression failure localized on this wood. Wood is super interesting because it does not behave the same in all directions. You can even see it in the grain of this wood here. So that's going to be something very interesting we're going to talk about when we talk about wood failure. Look, they've even built a roller into this loading method of this testing apparatus. This is a concrete beam failure due to bending strength. You can see that it looks different than the shear load. This is a series of cracks and some squashing here. Concrete is complete crap in tension. It's why we put steel on the tension side of an object. So normally we're bending beams like this, so we put steel in the bottom to deal with our tension. This concrete beam is being tested like this. So there are um, supports off screen that you can't see. And there's an, it's so weird with this fish island, is being pushed upwards like that. And you can see that there's tension on the top and compression on the bottom. So a little bit of compression failure right here and tension failure by the concrete actually opening up right there. Bending failure for steel. Steel is ductile. That means it can have very large deformations without appearing to fail. But there are large deformations. Those large deformations can become so large that we actually can end up with a stability problem. So this has gone from being supported on its two supports to not having any support. If that bend it, bent, bend it, bent that much, it would actually come off the supports and hit the ground and fail. Torsion. You can see a bolt's been torqued right around until it failed on that plane. Again, we're not doing torsion, so don't worry about it too much. A torsion failure in a steel shaft. Um, uh, a connection failure here. 
connection failure for uh, screws. You can see that classic um, slipped plane look where it ends up skewed on an angle. Uh, a connection failure for a bolt in shear. Often when we build buildings with steel, we um, the expensive thing is kind of getting the crane there and lifting it into place. So they'll hoist it into place and tack a few bolts in um, with the idea that they come back later and finish putting all the bolts in. So they just put enough in to hold its own self weight and keep it stable and then they come back and put them in. The danger is if they forget to come back and put them in and you build the rest of the building, you can end up with a failure. A steel plate in tension where it's actually been pulled apart. Um, uh, a connection failure for anchor pullout. If I have this here like this and I push on it, that back corner wants to come out of the ground. So what we actually end up doing is holding on to it or pulling down on it. That means we have tension on this corner right here. It's a lot harder to connect for. It's essentially saying that we are creating a moment connection. We're creating a couple with these anchor bolts. Um, if those can pull up out of the ground, we're going to have a tension failure at our connection. One of the things we'll often do is take these connections and try to spread them apart or increase the couple distance between those to try to ensure we have more space between our, our, uh, our forces that are counteracting each other. Um, oh look, I have some videos. I wonder if we'll launch. Yay. Oh, no, that didn't actually do anything for you guys. Um, I have video failures. Let's, let's, uh, I'm going to close, um, bring my email over here. I'm going to open a browser. Let's come back to our slideshow. And let's see if we can get this launched. Ooh, this is fun. Let me get my sound going here a little bit. This is a show of all time games on a window screen with a grain running parallel to the beam axis. The beam is made of soft wood fine class C and 4. The login diagram shows the simple support being subjected to four point bending. Under this login array, yeah, that's not very the central part of the specimen, and we begin to see the beam bending under the load. This continues until so the thin fiber shape? stresses in the tensile zone reach the failure strength of the wood, and brittle fracture occurs. So there, you can see the failure right there. Again, we're going to talk a lot about this now, stuff. Now, let's slow that down and look closer slow. at the point of failure. We can see bearing deformations accumulating under the loading heads. However, stresses continue to increase in the central part of the beam. Soon, the tensile strength of wood in the bottom fiber is reached and fast growing crack develops. Force displacement graph shows an initial We're going to talk about response. force displacement graphs or stress-strain graphs um, in the next couple lectures. So that is something very interesting and pertinent to us. We're just not going to worry about it right now. Um, I'm going to show you another video. There's a plywood beam failing. I forgot I had all these videos. This is exciting. I feel like I'm going to go show my structures one class. This one's a bit bad. So you can see it being loaded. Let's make sure we're not wasting our time. Very exciting music. It's taking way too long. 
Oh, see it break there. All right, let's watch it just before it breaks. So this is a multi-supported beam. So there, we had failure there. So that one was sheer in a plywood. plywood. You can see it propagated on that classic diagonal. And look where it started. It started right here. If I was going to draw the sheer diagram of this, my free body diagram, would look like this, where we have two point loads down, one up. My shear diagram would probably look like, what would it look like? Come down. I am speculating that it would look something like this, assuming those were, it's not very much to scale, um, and they had a failure right at that connection point. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, we would expect it to be where the shear is highest. There's probably, if this was more uniform, it would have been more clear, um, but uh, you can very clearly see that shear failure. All right, let's get... Why are you still playing? Okay. Let's do a concrete beam. I like this one. My whole family is on the internet, so this might be a little bit struggling. So again, we've got another um, force displacement diagram or a uh, stress strain diagram, if you want to talk about it that way. And they're actually indicating where the cracks are, which I really like. And they're showing kind of where internal forces are in it. You can see cracks. Oh, and then there's a shear crack right along there. It's hit reinforcing, so it's behaving, or you can actually see the crack until it finally overloads it completely. It's still there, it's taking some load, but not much. Um, so it's bought some time in spite of the fact that it's failing. So sorry, I know when we're watching the uh, videos, there's a, a lag between me and the video, but you guys can deal with that. Want to stand out online? Go to Wix.com no. and create a professional website that's sure to get you noticed. Start from school. No. Stop, you. Everything is happening so slowly, my mouse isn't even working properly. Um, and then let's look at a concrete beam in bending instead of shear. It's a little bit harder to find a video of that. So I like this one as well. So this is actually at U of T in 2014. So let's just come along a little bit here. These, these tests can be really slow again a stress strain curve or a force displacement graph. Um, when I was in university, they actually had a, um, a concrete slab they were testing and the testing took weeks 
weeks and weeks and weeks. Most of the time, the term I was there, um, it was a big deal when it finally tested to completion. We knew it was coming, and so we had a big party where we all stood around. Yeah, it wasn't watching paint dry, but it was pretty darn close. Let's see, we can see cracks. So they get yielding. Oh, you can see it moving a lot. Here we go. Everybody just seems to keep doing their thing in the background, not that interested. Oh, it's starting to really go now, it's really going. You can see the concrete falling out the bottom. And they're getting ready for it. <laughs> Doesn't matter how well you are prepared, you would jump for that. Okay, so those were just some, a few failure videos, more because it's fun and this is kind of a boring lecture, so I thought that might be uh, uh, something that might interest you guys. Um, uh, when I was in university, we made our own beams for part of our one of our three concrete classes. Yes, three entire terms just on concrete. Uh, uh, we made our own beams, and we had to reinforce them in different ways to force different types of failures. Um, and there was a surprise failure in one of the ways, and we were taking markers and tracking lines on the concrete beam, and um, we had a particular type of failure where essentially the rebar shoots out, it not shoots out the end of it, but it pops the end of the concrete beam off and we had it like rocket across the room. If anyone had been standing there, it would have been, the little glasses and helmet we were wearing would not have been enough to protect the person from any damage. It was a, it was a truly heart-stopping moment. There was screaming all around. Um, I've shown you guys this video before. I'm, I'm going to move on in the videos, mostly because I want to have time to do some of the math examples for you guys. Um, but this is, well, let's see. Um, so here's another force displacement diagram. And when we do it with um, an earthquake, uh, we call it a hysteresis, which means we load it in one direction and then we load it in the other direction. So we get a diagram that starts to do this kind of funky shape. So any engineer looking at any of these diagrams that I was just showing you knows instantly that it's a force displacement diagram or stress strain diagram. And then if we see it cyclical like that, it's a hysteresis of a, uh, an earthquake. So you can see this column buckling right along here. And you can see this plate yielding here. Yielding isn't something we've talked much about, um, but we are going to be talking about yielding a lot later on in this term. This one's kind of fun because it tests it right to failure. Um, and if you watch these diagrams, you see that the amount of load it takes, it's going up, so it's taking more and more load, and it's moving more and more. And then ultimately, it will stop being able to take load, and there will be a failure. And if you're watching both at the same time, you'll actually see this jump a little bit and crack. So you can see something starting to happen. We've got a crack on one side, so the other side was able to take some load still, and now completely failed. So you can see this right down here. Um, <clears throat> this one's kind of fun because it's just, it's showing um, yielding that switches to tension 
um, for some, and then also some bolts and shears. So it's like three different types of failure all in one video. So first, so this is another seismic product that Cast Connects, that the last one was Cast Connects, the company I worked for for a while, that they developed to um, help dissipate earthquake load in a building by transforming it into energy. Um, and uh, they do that by the steel yielding and absorbing the energy instead. Um, so first these fingers all start to bend and then when they get stretched enough they actually start to be pulled on in tension and all of these bolts are in shear. By the way, this piece of steel is massive. It's a massive piece of steel. The force on this to be bending like this is absolutely, oh, well, you can see 2,000 kilonewtons acting on this. So uh, 2,000 times 225, um, 450,000 pounds is what's acting on this. So you can see the, the hysteresis here. Um, and I believe the first failure is a bolt and shear or a finger, I can't remember. The really great thing is that even if a finger fails, there's more fingers. Oh, there, one of the fingers fell away. Those things I think were an inch thick. So, insane, the forces on this. There you go, more steel failing apart um, until there's not really anything left worth testing anymore. Um, so new products have to go through these tests to actually prove that they can do what they need to. Um, most products that we have that behave in a normal way or they're a competitor or something like that, um, we can do the math to prove what they will do. But this being something that um, it's a proprietary element that they um, license and engineer themselves. They need to be able to prove to other engineers that it can do what they've said it can do. And this is part of that. So stiffness is all about preservation of finishes and comfort of the people in the building. It is not a life safety issue. They're closer to guidelines than they are absolute information. Um, we worry about vertical, horizontal, rotational, soil, uh, stiffnesses, and vibration. We're not going to worry about that. Um, so stiffness is more guidelines, but they are very, very strong guidelines. Um, uh, vibration has a few strength requirements embedded in it, but mostly it is still about um, guidelines. The tricky part is, is that as much as it's not life safety and it's all about perception, um, if you don't meet those minimum guidelines, if somebody does not like it, you'll probably be sued. And if you can't say I did what is reasonable that most engineers will do, you'll be at fault. Um, even though that there's nothing wrong with the building, uh, that's what most people get sued about. If you are not going to follow the guidelines, making sure that everybody understands why we're not following the guidelines and that they agree with it is equally satisfactory. If um, you have a client that wants a very kind of whimsical and free stare and you say, okay, but here's what it needs to meet vibration um, and stiffness requirements and they don't want to and you say, okay, but you are going to feel it when your kid runs up the stairs you're going to feel that. And they say, no, that's okay, we want that. And you get them to sign off on it, it says it on the drawings and everybody understands it. If they then sue you because they can feel it when their kid runs up the stairs, you'd probably be okay. But yeah, it's a slightly more rigorous process. So you really, if you can meet the guidelines, just meet the guidelines. Like don't go out of your way to not meet the guidelines if you, if you can just meet them. Um, I wouldn't start worrying about trying to get away from the guidelines unless there is something um, uh, inhibiting it. If, if it like kills the design intent or um, nothing's available or it becomes unfeasible to build the project, that's when I'd start thinking about deviating from the guidelines, but making sure everyone is clear and understands why. So uh, the basic one is for beams. 
uh, beams and purlins and that sort of thing. So these are our serviceability limits. Again, for those of you that were in structures one, um, we found uh, a small issue in the sizing guideline, or not the sizing guidelines, the serv serviceability limits, where when the new code came out, it started referencing the new material data um, that made slight changes to it. Um, wood had some of the biggest changes in it. Um, again, um, my husband is literally on the code committee <laughs> for the wood uh, code and was not aware that that change had been made. Um, so, um, you know, this is the new uh, improved uh, deflection guidelines or serviceability limits. And it varies based on whether it's a roof or a floor, whether you're talking about snow, live, or dead and snow and dead and live. Um, and whether or not it is susceptible to damage, the finishes are susceptible to damage or not susceptible to damage. So that means are there finishes that would crack, like drywall or plaster um, or a concrete topping. If those things are on it, it's susceptible to damage. And then it's broken down into what material it is. Is it steel, wood, or concrete, or masonry even? Masonry is... Um, pretty broad, it has one guideline, um, L over 480, but a maximum of 20 millimeters, or about three quarters of an inch, um, and that's it. But it is pretty stringent. Um, it, you do not allow much deflection in masonry elements, simply because it cracks so easily. Um, uh, steel, um, we have some clauses here. Mostly that there's no standard criteria in the steel book, but there's an industry standard that if I talked to somebody in Germany, and I have, uh, they would use these same criteria. Um, in the States, all over Canada, those ones are so embedded in our engineering culture that, yeah, it might not be listed in the code, um, but if we didn't do it and there was a cracking problem, another engineer would say, but this is what every other engineer in the world does. Um, and so it would be hard to say that um, we did something reasonable. Um, what we're talking about is how much does an object deflect. If it's a cantilever, we're talking about half of the deflection criteria. So let's look at an example here. What is the amount of live deflection we will accept for a wood floor beam with drywall? So drywall means it is susceptible to cracking, it has finishes susceptible to cracking, that spans 10 feet and has a two foot cantilever. So we're worried about the live load deflection. There are two different criteria we have to worry about, but this question is just asking us about the live one. For wood, for a floor, for finishes susceptible to cracking. So we have a floor, we're talking about live, susceptible to damage with wood. We'd be worried about an L over 360 serviceability limit. So, we convert our 10 foot to meters just because we often work in meters. I would be very clear what I'm looking for in the question. Um, <clears throat> so, the live criteria for a wood floor with finishes is L divided by 360. So, we would take our 3,048 millimeters and divide it by 360 and get 8.47 millimeters. We need to check the, or we need to figure out what the limit is on the cantilever as well, uh, so we convert it to millimeters. The deflection criteria is half of whatever it was for the backspan, or our normal member. So instead of L divided by 360, it's L divided by 80. So 610 divided by 180. Our allowable deflection for that cantilever tip right here is 3.4 millimeters. Uh, we have serviceability limits for lateral loads as well. That applies to both story to story height and the overall height of the building. For wind, it's H over 500, and that is often about making sure our windows don't pop out of the window seals or that we don't crush our windows by squishing on the corners as we start to deflect, as we rack the building. You can imagine if there's a window right here, that window is actually quite stiff, but not very strong. And so as the building moves, the glass can't move. So we build 
a shoe around it that allows the building to move around the window. But if we hit that limit, well, two things, the window could pop out of the seal and fall on the ground, or we could crush the window. Uh, we do story to story and overall height, because you can imagine if we met the deflection criteria for this whole building, but we only had small amounts of deflection for each story, this building, this story here then, that's where all the deflection is and we would very much break these windows. So we have to worry about both story to story and the overall height of the building. Vibration, I talked about last term. Um, we're worried about um, continuous vibration. So that's, you know, a repetitive movement. Humans tend to naturally move at 2.5 hertz. That's our kind of natural um, movement um, frequency that we hit. So dancing is usually at 2.5. Um, what I often do, well, I might as well do it. I'm going to be weird. What I often do is get the whole um, class to stand up and very slowly go up and down on your toes. And you can really start to feel your calves burn as slow as you can. Then I get them to do it as fast as you can, so faster than is comfortable. Again, you can really feel your calves burn. But then I tell students to shake it out a little bit and then do it at whatever feels natural. What's the, what's the speed you could do it forever? And this is probably about 2.5 hertz. And if you look around the room, which we don't have that right now, most people would probably be doing it at the same rhythm as you. Maybe not right at the same time, but you can imagine if we all did it at the exact same time and we were all doing that together, you could probably start to um, uh, really have a big impact on things. The other thing is transient vibration. And that is, if we have an impact, how long can we continue to feel the residual vibration of that? as it starts to dampen down. So what we'll often do to test that is a heel drop. If you go up and you drop your heels down on the floor. You can see my clothes shook a little bit there for a bit afterwards. Um, that's because uh, my wood house, as much as it has some great damping ability, it um, continued to carry that load, that vibration for a bit until the mass of the floor dampened it out. What we're looking for is a quick dampening of that load. Um, people understand one quick movement or one quick vibration um, effect, but they have a harder time with the long tail on the vibration. Um, I've talked about Gold Ring in the past that had the MRI machine on the fourth floor, um, which is very sensitive to vibration, and uh, the Olympic weightlifting um, uh, room on the third floor and the third floor was hung from the bottom of the fourth floor. So you can imagine not an ideal circumstance. So we had to isolate that Olympic weightlifting room from the rest of the building, um, but still hang it. So we had to put um, vibration dampeners um, uh, in between it. So we, we isolated it for vibration, but not for carrying the load. So what, when I gave a tour in 2017, um, during the TSA party, uh, I had some people stand, it was being used, um, so I had some people stand on the Olympic weightlifting side and some people stand on the main floor, and when the Olympic weightlifter dropped the weight on the floor, the people standing on the floor could feel it and the rest of us couldn't feel a thing. So we had done, we had managed to isolate that vibration. Uh, the one that always gets all the publicity is resonance, or an amplification of vibration, or vibration amplification. Um, that's when a continuous load or a vibration is happening at the same frequency as the building or object. They can start to excite each other and build up that vibration, um, and that can ultimately lead to a failure. Um, uh, so it can be human movement, or wind, or seismic. Um, I thought I had a video here for this. Um, I think maybe I do in a few slides, so we'll come back to it. 
Uh, I've told this story before uh, of my crappy little house in Pickering that's since been torn down and a mansion built there. Not by me. Somebody else. We sold the lot for... Tore it down. Uh, uh, we had put all of our storage up in the attic and we were turning this funny little spot into an office. Um, when we demoed, we saw what, where we expected there to be a beam. This right here is actually just a two by four on flat. We expected a series of beams or a piece, series of pieces of wood laminated together running across there. Um, I think this was deflecting something like two and a half inches. It was something absolutely ridiculous over a very short span. Um, everything was cracked in this place, so uh, it wasn't a surprise that we had um, huge deflections and we didn't really care, but we realized we should fix it, um, especially if we were taking the time to re-drywall all this and do finishes. So we, uh, I did the calculation, and what we needed was two, two by eights or two by tens, I can't remember, laminated together in the strong direction. So you can see here it's been fixed and some insulation and new windows going in. And this is why we have deflection criteria. Um, I know it looks like this is this house with, you know, the. it looks eerily like I, that is taken from this room. And when I bought this house, the walls were painted yellow and pink, just like this, but it is not. Um, although this ceiling was cracked and we had to do a lot of work to repair it. Um, you can see why. And so drywall, plaster, anything that has finishes that crack, um, a concrete topping would crack, anything like that. That's why we have deflection criteria. I said masonry has the most stringent deflection criteria. This is why. It does not take um, a lot to really see the impact of um, of uh, um, deflection in masonry. This one happens to be differential settlement, where one corner of the house was on less stiff soil, so it moved a bit more. It might have been well within normal amounts that a building could move, but because we're supporting masonry, that, that shows up in a very large crack in the masonry. And as I know here from this house, that's how the mice get into your house. And the hornet's nest. Um, this is a foundation wall that's pin supported at the top and pin supported at the bottom with soil load pushing on it, bending in between its two supports. And it's got a crack right here. Um, we would often put reinforcing there to stop that from happening. And lateral deflection where our building is actually racking and trying to tip over here. Um, so these are the two videos that I was talking about. So this is um, damping, where we actually use mass to stop a building from moving as much in an earthquake. Um, it's the same way if you have a glass and you fill it with water and you push it, the water stops the glass from sliding quite as far. Um, it's the same idea with that. Um, what I really like in it is that there is, well, let's uh, you guys can watch this on your own. We've watched it before. Um, there is a girl holding on to um, the building, um, and the camera is obviously attached to the building. So it doesn't look like the building is moving. It just looks like the tune mass damper is. But it is the thing that is moving less. The relative movement between the two objects is what we're really perceiving, but the our, our building looks like it's staying still because it's the point of view of the camera. So everybody else looks like they're moving around um, when it's really the building that's moving around the most. People are trying to counteract the movement by doing this, except for the person holding on to the display, and she looks like she is not moving because she's attached herself to the building, even though her and the building are moving the most. Uh, Tacoma bridge collapse showing resonance. Sort of. There's a bunch of other things happening. There's two types of resonance happening. There's fluttering of the uh, cables. 
Um, so it's obviously, as with everything, much more complex than just saying it was amplification. Um, but this bridge actually goes to failure. So feel free to watch this video as well. Stability. Um, stability, um, we look at a few different things. We look at sliding, we look at tipping, elastic, ponding, no load path, um, and then buckling. Now, these are just a few examples. Basically, what we want to know is, does our thing stay in its spot? If it can't stay in its spot, it can't even start to resist the loads that we need to talk about. So before we can even apply a load, have it fail by strength, we need it to be stable. And this is often where we make use of free body diagrams. Is our object stable? We have to stop it from moving up and down, side to side, and from spinning in any of the directions and in and out of the page movement. So the, in the 3D world, there are six degrees of freedom. Uppy downy, side to sidey, inny outy, and spinning in all of those three, about all three of those axes as well. We often make life a bit more simple by breaking it down to 2D planes at once, where if we were talking about our standard kind of drawing, we worry about it going up and down, side to side, and spinning about our Z axis. So if we're worried about sliding, our object sitting on the ground slides. So we have a lateral force pushing on it, and it starts to slide across the ground. If there is nothing to stop this here, or if it, the force isn't enough to resist this lateral movement, we have an unstable building because it is sliding. If that lateral load is enough to be resisted by friction or some other means here, so it can't slide, but if it doesn't have the means to resist overturning or it wants to tip or there's no couple here to resist the bottom loads, it will tip over. So if I put a lateral load on it and there is nothing to hold this down or if there's not enough weight to counteract it, we have tipping. So it would not be stable then. Um, elastic stability is a little bit different. Um, elastic stability is when um, we apply a load to something and it moves, but now the, mo now the load is in a different spot, so it causes more movement. And now it's in a different spot, and so it causes more movement. So what we do is we analyze it by saying, okay, we're assuming our load is just a little bit unskewed. Is, how much does this move? And when we calculate it, we see how much it moves due to that load being offset from its centroid. And then we calculate it again with it being in the new spot. And then we calculate it again. And if those increments get smaller, it is stable. If those increments get larger, it is not stable. It's the same idea with ponding, but it's maybe a little bit easier to understand. If I had this beam and I knew it could take the snow load on it and it had always worked forever, no big deal, and then I put a new mechanical unit on it. So now this roof beam that had always worked is bent a little bit and now it rains. Well that level plane, more water is going to be in the middle than at the ends. So now it's going to deflect a little bit more because it's got more water in the middle now. But now that means more water is going to go to the middle because it's deflecting just a little bit more. And what we do is we calculate that and see as we increase the amount of water that's there because it's ponding, does the increment of deflection get smaller and smaller and smaller or does it get larger and larger and larger? And then we can determine if it is stable. We then still have to check at this point here if it's strong enough. So. It might be stable at this point, but it might not be strong enough. So we have to check multiple things. And then this unstable one might turn into a strength one. So it's not always clear if we're talking about strength, stiffness, or stability. It's usually precipitated by a particular one. Um, and the ultimate failure might look slightly different, but it's usually pretty easy to see what the triggering factor is. 
buckling, buckling is when we have a compressive load on something slender. So this cross-sectional area might be strong enough to resist the load, but it is not strong enough to stop the object from buckling, or it's not stiff enough to stop the object from buckling due to a compressive load. Tension objects don't see buckling, just our compressive objects. Um, this is going to be really important when we start doing column design in a few weeks. Local buckling, and this one becomes more clear when we look at the pictures, which we've seen before, um, where uh, as we apply a compressive load to something, where a portion of it or an element within the overall object buckles. So this is a great example of stability. This might not be obvious to you, but I'm telling you a story about why this is tipping. Most people look at this and think it must be strength, that it must have been these little um, piles didn't work. But the piles were only there to resist downward loads and some earthquake loads for um, uplift. Probably worked just fine. The truth is that this particular building, when they built it, they dug out all kinds of soil on one side, and then they stacked it in a big pile on the other side of the building. And so if you've ever stood on the side of um, a hole in sand, you know that if you put load here, it wants to fill in that hole. And that's exactly what happened, and the building then tipped over due to a soil instability. So. Um, this is actually a question in your assignment, so if anyone has watched this lecture, you have the answer. It is instability. It is not stable. It is a stability problem. I don't know where, I don't know what caused this building to slide there. My guess is it was on the back of a flatbed truck and slid off. Still works. Still a stability problem. It is a sliding stability problem, um, but it was really hard to find pictures of that. Somebody sliding on, oh, skaters. Somebody skating on ice would be a sliding stability problem. Um, so ponding. Here's an example where they put a mechanical unit on the roof, and now there's water ponding there. Um, and so in a rainstorm, that's a little bit deeper than the rest, which means there's a little bit more load in that spot, which might then make it deflect a little bit more than somewhere else, which starts to make the problem, we have to check the problem again and again. Lateral torsional failure. We talked about buckling being for something under compression, but something in bending, the top is in compression and the bottom is in tension. So let's take a look at it when it's on our slender side, or this is slender, the top is in compression and the bottom is in tension. The top is in compression and the bottom is in tension. So when I try to bend it, the top wants to buckle because it's in compression and it's slender, but the bottom is in tension and tension doesn't see buckling, so it doesn't try to buckle. So if just the top is buckling, it pops out sideways, but only the top half does. And so now there's weight not over the middle of the beam and it tries to twit, to twist or there is torsion on it. So we call it a lateral, or a sideways, torsional, or twisting failure. And that is due to compression in the top cord. A buckling failure in a steel column. So this is the overall column popping out sideways. This is the buckling failure in um, uh, two two by fours screwed together that Dave and I did for fun when we jacked up the ceiling when we put in the new beam to fix that ceiling problem. Um, uh, railway ties, the rail, railway tracks. Um, if you've ever had, been on a GO train when they say they have to go slow due to the heat, it's because they are expanding and putting compression in between the ties. And if the train goes over too fast, that's just going to, uh, this is just holding on and it could pop. So they do it slowly that, so that there's no catastrophic failure due to that. This is a really good image of local buckling. So you can see that the top cord's in compression, the bottom's in tension, so we're not going to see any local failures there. 
but the whole thing isn't failing. The whole thing isn't popping out sideways. We have kind of an oil canning or a warping in the top of one flange of the element. So that is a local buckling failure. The failure is local. And the best, one of the best ways to look at that, here's another one, where we've got um, some loading mechanism that's loaded the top in compression and we've got local buckling failures. This column, so we saw the column where there was overall buckling, the whole column was moving sideways. Now as much as this, the whole column is moving sideways, look at this, look at this warping. That's a really good indica indication that we've got local buckling happening. And just a really good image kind of showing local buckling. So the idea is always to ask yourself, is it strong enough? And that means, have we checked for moment, shear, axial, torsion, for, uh, to make sure that it, the, fa the factored load is less than the reduced capacity? Is it stiff enough? So have we checked all the materials for all the deflection criteria that could possibly be applied to it? And is it stable? Does it slide? Does it twist? Does it turn? Does it spin? Does it tip over? We have to check all of those, and we have to check all of those things for every building or every part of a building, every element within the building, and every connection. So we have a lot of things that we have to check. So now I'm going to break off and I'm going to do um, a review of um, the project. I thought the best way to do a review of the term would be to pick the project and go through um, an example from the project. I'm going to pick my own. I, if you happened to have one of these members, that's just an absolute fluke. I just looked at it and picked one that I could grab in one image. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about project part one um, and what I saw and what I expected just to kind of give you guys an idea. Um, uh, I can't give you guys individual feedback, but I can give overall feedback. Um, there's just some funny ways uh, about how we have to give the information back to people. So I can give you um, an overall, I pulled out some comments that I found kind of repeated throughout most projects. Um, and then I'll go through actual examples in part two. So part one, um, uh, mostly they were fantastic. Um, my hope here was that this was your opportunity to be really creative. Um, uh, a table is totally fine, um, but uh, you, you, this, the problem with structural engineering is that you guys are denied your opportunity to be creative, but you guys are at U of T um, doing architecture. You guys need to be creative, so I don't want to kill that. Um, if you did a table, that's fine. You got, you got your marks. I marked it. Um, but I was um, slightly more particular. You had to do everything just so. If you did kind of a relative, like I talk about a table all the time um, as kind of like the most basic thing you could possibly think about for a static object. Um, if you took the time to be creative, I definitely looked at things. Um, and if something was very wrong, I would deduct points. But I was more willing to kind of work through or see beyond some of the issues. Um, so uh, I will try to also apply that to um, part one for your studio project. If you have a very basic structure, there's nothing wrong with it. That's not, I'm try not trying to say that um, if you do something basic, you're wrong, because that is not it at all. Um, but if you have, um, uh, is your battery dying? Yeah. Sorry. It's not you. You're not, you didn't kill it. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> I'm, I'm a woman. We apologize when we don't need to. And I've got to, sorry, I've got to break myself of that habit. Um, um, oh, there's some new students that you wouldn't have met. So say hello to, there's some. Hello, everyone. This is my husband, Dave. He's also a structural engineer. He owns Blackwell Engineering. Um, he's my partner in crime for most things. Sometimes we work together, sometimes we don't. <laughs> that is sometimes very... we work with each other, sometimes we work against each other. <laughs> <laughs> very rarely against each other, very rarely. Um, so he appears now and then. He um, co-taught the, um, uh, the elective I did in the fall, and we often give lectures together. Um, but uh, he is one of the, uh, he is the principal owner at Blackwell Engineering, kind of one of the 
the great firms in Toronto and Canada, honestly, actually probably North America. No one ever wants to admit their partner's better than them at what they do, but that guy's a friggin' genius. So, you know, at a certain point you just gotta own it. Uh, yeah, my frozen lunch. Yeah, okay, I'd have that. And there's ones in there that are more for your... It's uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, in, in structures, too, for your studio project, if, if your structure is very simple, that's okay. You're going to get all your marks. Um, but if yours is very complicated and complex, I might be less quick to deduct marks if you do something wrong. So just to try to even the playing field a little bit. Um, for, part w for part one of Structures 1, um, the idea was that it should have been the worst load of that type. Um, so if you had a table um, and you looked at it with a cup on it and you looked at it with Shannon on it or you looked at it with... Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger on it, or you looked at it with five Arnold Schwarzeneggers on it. Um, obviously, those are all the exact same load type. They're just a load in the middle of the building, essentially. So the worst case is going to be five Arnolds sitting on each other's shoulders. Um, what I was looking for is the worst of each type. So um, maybe an Arnold standing in the middle, maybe then an Arnold laying down, um, maybe an Arnold leaning on it. Um, not Arnold's in the middle, Shannon in the middle, a cup in the middle. Again, I was very nice on the points for these, um, but um, that's kind of what the idea was there. Um, the idea was always being the worst of that type of load. Uh, we tend not to draw internal forces on an overall free body diagram. We looked at a free body diagram, and then we looked at partial free body diagrams. The free body diagram is all the external loads and reactions. The partial free body diagram is all of the external loads and reactions plus the internal loads where we cut it. But we wouldn't draw those internal loads on the overall free body diagram. Dimensions are important. Um, we need to know where things, where these loads are, especially if it's causing something to tip over. Analogous point loads are only helpful for vertical reactions. Um, if you are talking about internal loads, you need to keep the loads spread out. Location matters. Where a load is applied to something is very, very, very important. Um, um, what's a good one? Uh, okay, so um, if I had this, if I draw the load here at the top, it might have a different impact than drawing the load here at the middle. If I have an object that's tilted and I'm applying this load, where it is matters because if it's trying to tip it over, how far it is from the centroid makes a difference. So dimensions are important, but also the location of the load is very important. Um, uh, Oh, the lateral loads um, are about when it's on the object, not what causes it to slide. Once it's sliding, it's not static, and we don't care about it anymore. It's mechanical's problem once it starts to move. Um, what we were talking about was static objects. So we want to see the load applied to it and the reaction that is resisting it. You didn't have to calculate it, but it certainly wouldn't be zero if there is a load applied to it here there's got to be a reaction that stops it from sliding. So if you had a load case where there was a lateral load on it, the Rx couldn't be zero because then it would have slid and it wouldn't be stable. If it can tip over, it needs a moment connection at the base. So if you were drawing a lamp post and you put a lateral load on it, your reactions aren't just an upward reaction and a sideways reaction. There is no thing that stops it from spinning. This either needs to be a moment connection here, or you need some way to resist the load at the top. It's a lamppost. There's nothing there to resist that, and you need a moment connection to stop this. Otherwise, that lateral load is going to tip it over. 
Um, it didn't necessarily need to be a moment, but it needed to be a couple of some sort. Um, if you had a large area getting your load out of the bottom, you would have a lit area load. So if you had a point load coming down on something and you had a big spread out object at the base, well, you would have an area load at the bottom. Remember our footings that we talked about where we looked at what, um, or what, um, where we, did we talk about bearing yet? I can't remember. But we certainly looked at, um, yeah, we did. We looked at um, what area we would need to resist that load. Um, and so if you have an area that the load is spread out on, we need a, the, and again, you didn't need to calculate things, but your, your image should indicate that it's not just one analogous point load there. Um, just some other fun comments. Again, these are just just things I noticed and uh, said out loud, so I thought I'd share with them. The person who did the Lego, thank you. You felt every parent's, every parent's battle. Um, you had a load case where a person stepped on the, lo lo the Lego. Cats, is it quarantine? What is happening? I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen a cat in one of these projects before. I've been doing this project for five years and I've never maybe one cat. Um, there were a lot of cats. I mean, seriously, there was, there were five separate projects where the object was a cat stand. Like, you know, the thing that cats climb on and play on. Totally fine, but cats, man, there were so many cats. Um, uh, somebody did a great one with a Christmas tree, oddly enough. You were the only person that didn't do a cat. I feel like there was a real opportunity for uh, a, a cat in a Christmas tree causing the Christmas tree to fall over. What did you need to resist the cat load? You, you didn't lose any points because you didn't do a cat. You didn't, don't worry about that. But I was just found it kind of intriguing that the one that didn't have a cat is the one that you hear everybody talk about. Um, person who did the guitar, very good. Um, I feel like smashing the guitar was a lost opportunity as well. Although I guess you did pick an acoustic guitar and there's not a lot of rage smashing of guitars with, a, with an acoustic guitar. Um, the person did the Simpsons couch. You forgot all the Simpsons on the couch as your worst case load condition. Um, uh, so obviously you, lo you, you failed. No, I'm joking. You did not fail. You, I didn't deduct any points for that. But um, I feel like, feel like you missed that, man. That should have been there. Um, uh, all the Simpsons on the couch was probably the peak load that that couch could have. Okay, so I've now picked um, a column, a beam, and a truss. I'm not going to go through the full truss calculation. I'm not going to do the method of sections um, with the for partial free body diagrams at each location, but I am going to go through and do these three elements and draw the free body diagrams and look at what it took um, or what I was expecting to see in the project. So I'm going to switch to um, uh, the, the calculation mode now. Okay, so we're going to start with our column. Um, we're going to take a look at the project PDF here um, and you can see that I said we were going to do column D2 so this column right here and it looks like it's picking up portions of roof that have 2SO1 2DO1 picking up some beams there and on the upper floor it's got RS01 and RD01 and then this is the truss we're doing and this is the beam we're going to look at. So um, it seems like I need to figure out four different assemblies. I could do it as I did each element but the very first one I need is the column. Um, and the column seems to have all of those assemblies be part of it. So, let's 
take a look at those different assemblies. Um, it looks like we were given the loads for everything. We just had to add them up. Um, so for RS01, we were able to add up the assembly that was given to us and get a total. For our, DR, for our D01, we could add it up and get an assembly. 2S01 and 2D01. The other things we need are snow. Now, it said on the drawings that, um, let's, let's go back to those drawings for a second. And this is level two. Let's go to the roof. Um, so it's telling us the superimposed loads used in the design. So SS and SR are not the loads. They're the basis that we use for determining the loads. Drawings, we typically have already calculated the load. Um, I mentioned that in um, the, the lecture where we talked about um, uh, what drawings look like. So this snow load, has somebody has already taken SS and SR and looked at the roof and looked at the buildings around it, and they've said normally the roof low snow load is 1.29 kPa, uh, and plus any accumulated snow loads shown on the plan uh, anywhere else. Well, it doesn't look like they have any on here, and I also told you throughout the lectures that I'm not going to be so mean as to make you calculated accumulated snow loads. We are going to do something relatively basic. Rain due to 112 millimeters of rain in accordance with the roof slope, but I also told you that that would rarely govern. We still have to put it on the drawings because the building department checks to make sure we've thought about it. Now, if the roof sloped enough, it might be something we had to worry about, but it would only locally impact a few elements. And then dead varies as per DAT slab or deck assembly. Um, so these are the slab and deck assemblies. So this is where we were getting that information for our particular calculation. So now let's come back to this. So uh, we know on the roof that there is 1.29 kPa. Oh, I forgot. Oh, look, there it is wrapped around. I was going to say I forgot to write kPa. Um, but that's for the ultimate limit states. And we know for a snow load, there was nothing saying that this is a, um, uh, a high importance building. So we would use um, SLS of 0.9. On the second floor, uh, we would have 4.8 kPa of live, and it showed that in the loading, or in the notes below the plan. So it looks like we have all of our loads here. It might be that I don't need to actually do any calculations as I'm looking at this. Okay, so let's take a look. Woo, that went very fast. All right. You know what? I'm gonna open. I'm gonna open the PDF that you used to generate this. I think that might be slightly more handy for you guys. Bear with me just a moment, folks. I want to be able to zoom in and talk about this. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I want you to see. Um, I want you to be able to practice it if you need to practice it. Um, project, project part two review. Here we go. Okay. All right. So here we can see uh, the the loads that we've talked about. So this is the sheet that's in the slideshow. And then we can start talking about our column. I, this isn't something that you have to do, but I always find it easy to draw myself a little diagram to see kind of what is loading this bad boy up. Um, so just a small understanding diagram for myself. Um, now, we can figure these loads out two ways. We can figure out the reactions of all of these elements and then apply them to these columns. And normally, if we were doing a full building, that's what we'd do. But we have an interesting thing here that we've just been asked to design this column. We happen to be doing this beam and this truss, but we're not doing the rest. So we're going to do it based on tributary area. The first
first thing now that I've drawn this I would like to do is draw my free body diagram because drawing the free body diagram helps us make sure that we have um, a stable element and that we're not forgetting anything. So a free body diagram has to have all the external loads and their location and all of the external reactions and their locations. So everything is in this plane, so that's pretty easy. At the floor, our column is supported by the foundation, or RY, and it's braced by the slab from moving around, or RX at level one. At level two, we only have a reaction because it's being held by the floor. It can't tip over because it's connected to our roof diaphragm. And then at the roof, we're braced in the X direction because it's connected to our roof. At our roof, we're gonna have a factored roof load. And at the second floor, we're gonna have a factored second floor load. And there is our free body diagram. And I've got the dimensions from floor to floor. For the roof, I often find it helpful to draw the tributary area. You don't have to do this. Um, I've figured it out by giving it color coding to help you guys out. So the tributary area for the pink zone is the full length of the truss that's spanning to it, divided by two, plus the tributary width <coughs> of the truss, divided by two, or 67.8 meters squared. I know that that is the zone that has the roof slab 01 dead load of 4.59, and we know that snow load is 1.29. The orange zone tributary area is also 67.8, but it has a different dead load, and we have the same snow load. So now I can figure out the dead load from each portion of different roof and the snow load, um, and then so I figured out those. Then I can come down to the second floor. I've got the slab over here and the deck over here. The tributary area from this side of the roof is this 10 meter span divided by two times our tributary width or 28.25. And we know the dead load there is 3.93 and the live load is 4.8. This side here, again, this is 10 meters, so we end up with the same tributary area. And our dead load here is 2.85, and our live load is 4.8. So we can figure out the dead and live load from each component. So at the roof, we have all of the dead loads and all of the snow loads and all of the live loads that are coming onto it from the roof. But we don't have any live loads, so I'm just not even going to bother. I'm going to take that step out. So we have uh, these two dead loads, the one from the pink part and the one from the orange part, adds up to 509.9 kilonewtons. The snow load is 75 total, 175 total. If I look at my two different factored load combinations, I, I think I'm not going to see this. I'm going to make it so you guys can see me. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do these out by hand. These calculations that I've done in the PDF are pretty great, so I think we're going to leave it like this. Um, so if I come back to this PDF, um, I then can factor this dead and snow load. We look at the ultimate dead case, or 1.5 times the dead load. We know there's no live, so any of the combinations that involve live aren't going to govern. Um, and so ultimate dead and snow seems like the uh, the next best one. So 1.25 times our dead load plus 1.5 times our snow load. It looks like that's our governing case. So we know that from level two to roof, we've got 899.9 kilonewtons acting on that column as our worst case factored load. From level one to level two, it's a little bit harder. 
We have some dead from the roof and some dead from the second. We have some snow from the roof and we have some live from the second. So it's not clear which load case is going to govern. This isn't that helpful to us because that was a very particular load combination on that portion of the column. We have to look at this portion now. So level one to level two is holding all those dead loads. So the 311 plus the 199 plus the 111 plus the 72 or 692.9 kilonewtons. We have all the snow from the roof, which was still the 175, but now we have the live load as well, or 271.2. Now it's not clear which load combination is going to govern. We need to check our dead load combination, or 1.4 times our dead load. Oh, I made a mistake up here. Sorry guys, I'm going to fix that. Uh, Level 2 to roof, dead load should be 1.4. Sorry about that. So this number right here should be 1.4. I can fix that. No big deal. You'll see that corrected in what's posted or what's in the, in the um, PowerPoint. Um, uh, so 1.4 times our dead load, we get uh, 970.1. And so now it's not clear which is going to be the governing case with dead as the prince or with snow as the principal and live as the companion, or live as the principal and snow as the companion. Gut feel, live is bigger, probably going to be live as the principal and snow as the companion, but let's just check both. 1.25 times our dead load, plus 1.5 times our snow load, plus 1 times our live load gives us 1,399.8. And then we have ultimate dead live as our principal, snow as our companion. So 1.25 times the dead load plus 1.5 times the, the live load plus 1 times the snow load. Or 1,447.9. That's the worst case in each part of our column. So, our axial force diagram, 900 kilonewtons here in compression, and 1,448 kilonewtons in compression from level two, or from level one to level two. Sizing guideline, I've got 4.2 meters, or 4,200 divided by 20, gives me 210 millimeters. Some of you used the 40 here, I didn't really take any points off for that because uh, I had said anything less than four meters definitely use the 20. Um, you all calculated that you only needed about um, uh, just just around a hundred millimeters, 105 millimeters to be exact, but um, most of you picked like a 114 HSS. Um, I can tell you that that's super slender, especially for these loads. Um, anything like this, I probably still would have used the, uh, the H divided by 20. Again, I didn't take off points for that um, uh, because I, I've also told you that that's the crappiest crap sizing guidelines. Um, but I'm going to use the H divided by 20. Um, I'd recommend a stocky W250 or an HSS 254 by 254, or possibly even a round 219 diameter. This was an important part of it, suggesting what size you were going to do. You'd get half marks for the, the sizing guideline if you only did this. And now, the sizing guideline was a very small part of the mark for the column as well. So if you forgot that, don't worry. You, weren't, you didn't fail the column portion. So that was everything I was asking for for the column. Let's take a look at beam 2B03. I like to start by drawing a free body diagram. I told you guys that for the beams, all the beams, you could treat it as a uniformly distributed live load, um, which means we have a, a load along every meter of the beam. Free body diagram has to have the reactions, the applied load, and the dimensions, so we have 10 meters, we have our Y reactions, which are going to act as a couple if it was trying to tip over, and we have RX. We don't know what RX is, we haven't solved this free body diagram yet. 
uh, and we have our applied line load, or our factored uniformly distributed load. The F is telling us that we're applying the factored one. If you did it with the point loads, I did not take points off for that. If you did it right, I did not take points off for that. Um, so some people did draw it as four individual point loads coming in on this beam. So this um, factored line load, we have to figure out what our factored loads are, and we have to multiply it by our tributary width. Looks like our tributary width is half of this distance plus half of this distance. Our loads, the dead load we already figured out was 2.85 kPa, and our live load was 4.8 kPa. And I just showed us our tributary width was 5.6 divided by 2 plus 5.7 divided by 2. So we can figure out the linear dead load. We can figure out the linear live load. And then we can take those and find the factored linear load that's going to be applied to our free body diagram. Or 1.25 times 16.1 plus 1.5 times 27.1, or 60.8 kilonewtons per meter. So every single meter of this beam is seeing 60.8 kilonewtons on it. Interestingly enough, we have a nice even number of 10. Um, so you can imagine that the analogous point load, which is not the same thing as the free body diagram, this is the free body <coughs> diagram, this is the analogous point load that is very helpful for finding the reactions. Um, 60.8 times the full 10 meters is 608 kilonewtons. Now, gut feel, this is where I would always say, what do I think the reactions are going to be? I think each half is going to get half of the total load, or 304 kilonewtons. But I told you that in this course, you had to do everything using the three equations we talked about and method of sections when we get to our partial free body diagrams. I told you you could not use the cheating easy equations for this course. Don't worry, I know more than half of you are going, oh, sugar, uh, because you did not do that. You used the equations that I showed you as the handy, easy way to do it. But, but I told you you can only check your work for that with this term. I did not take off many points. Not much at all. In fact, a very, very, very tiny amount of points for not doing that work. Um, next term, or sorry, this term, you do not have to do method of sections. You can feel free to use those handy dandy equations that I showed you, depending on what your uh, beam loading is. But last term, we were supposed to be testing you on method of sections. It's what I promised the accreditation people we were going to do. Um, so you did have to lose a little bit of marks if you didn't do it that way. So I have my analogous point load, which is my kind of temporary free body diagram, if you will, to help solve for my reactions. I can sum the forces in the x direction. I can sum the moments about a point, and I picked this point right here. And I can sum the forces in the y direction, and I can find that Rx equals zero. R2 equals 304 kilonewtons, and R1 equals 304 kilonewtons. That matches what I had predicted. Uh, now, I want to figure out what the internal forces are. I'm going to set it up so that I can find it using, that I'm cutting it at some unknown location between 0 and 10 meters. Um, so I'm going to pick a point X, and I'm going to cut this beam. I know that that means I have an analogous point load of uh, 60.8 kilonewtons per meter by the distance x that I'm cutting, or 60.8 x kilonewtons. Um, I know I've got my reactions over here, but this thing isn't moving up and down or spinning around or flying off in space, so there must be some internal forces that are keeping it tied to the other part of the beam and not flying off into space. So I've left a placeholder of V and M as those internal forces. Again, because this was structures one and only structures one, we had to do method of sections. I can use my three, di my three equations to help me determine that this is in static equilibrium. I can sum the forces in X, I can sum the forces in Y, and I can spin this about at some point. 
I am going to pick point x right here, and I'm going to do, use those three equations. I'm going to determine rx is 0. v equals 304 minus 60.8x, and that my moment is 304x minus 30.4x squared. Well, I want to draw my moment diagram, and, or my shear diagram and my moment diagram. I include my units, and moment is kilonewton meters, not kilonewtons, not kilonewtons per meter. Um, probably over a third of the class wrote kilonewtons here for meters in your free body diagram. Um, I, I'm not quite sure where it came from um, because I know that all of the examples I can remember, we wrote kilonewton meters here. So it is important to distinguish your units because it does tell you what you're talking about. I then plugged in at various locations x and saw what v was along the length of the beam. And I picked a few locations and checked what m was at various locations. And then I plotted those out along the length. I find it, well, you should always draw your shear diagram, your moment diagram, and your free body diagram on the same page. I usually like to draw them in line with each other so that if there was a point low here, you could see that it matched something here. Mixing them up with other drawings makes it very hard to follow along. You should always keep everything for one beam neatly contained on one page, and if you can, possibly aligned for these diagrams. Um, so that gives me my shear diagram, my moment diagram. I've indicated the maximum value. For shear, I have said that positive and negative is irrelevant. The reason we track it is to see when we cross the line, but the absolute value is what we care about for maximum. And so our maximum shear is 304 kilonewtons at either end. And our maximum moment is 760 kilonewton meters at the midpoint. Sizing guidelines, uh, 10 meters divided by 20 for a steel beam. And this is a steel drawing. We were talking about a steel beam. The, the loading listed that it was steel. We've been talking about steel for this project. You could see that we, an, we accounted for the weight of steel members. So we are looking at the steel sizing guidelines. It's not concrete. We would have drawn it different. Um, it's not wood or we would have had different loads. Um, I calculate that it needs to be at least 500 millimeters deep. That's not enough. We want to give a suggestion because we know uh, 500, if we just leave 500 millimeters on our, in our section for uh, a beam, we're probably not going to have enough space because it's probably going to be a W50 beam that we would need. Again, probably smart to leave a little bit more room than 530 millimeters because we know a W550 is only about 530 millimeters deep. Deflection limits. Um, we have toppings and terrazzo, um, so we know that there are finishes that are susceptible to damages. We know it's a steel building, uh, and so the dead plus live deflection limit for uh, a steel beam with um, finishes susceptible to damages is L divided by 240, or 41.7 millimeters. But there's two deflection criteria, because we don't know what loads these are being compared to yet. If if you did track the loads, that is fantastic too. We're really going to want that in this term because we are actually going to have to calculate what the actual load is. And we don't know which of these is going to govern because we're comparing them to two different loads. So the live limit, the allowable live deflection limit for a steel beam uh, with finishes susceptible to top, or Finishes susceptible to damage is L divided by 360, or 27.8 millimeters. We're going to track that for use for next term. Let's take a look at the truss now. Oh, nuts. Are they looking for their snack? Okay. Um, we might have, yeah. Uh, I'll get it ready in a minute. <laughs> Maybe we should just give them crappy sugar-filled bear pills. Sure. I hate to do that, but we're fully stocked for groceries. Um, so roof truss one, I find it handy to draw myself out a little uh, diagram or take a screen capture of what I'm looking at. 
And then just to make it easier, I've actually drawn the tributary areas. And I said the easier thing to do for a truss is actually all the series of point loads. And we do have a series of point loads. It was kind of a cheat that we did in the, 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 the deck one for this. Um, for people who had a slab coming in on the roof, yeah, technically you had a UDL coming in on top, um, but I said it was going to be a lot easier if you treated it as um, tributary areas coming in on top um, uh, so that you could calculate these point loads. Otherwise, you'd have to worry about bending in between each one of these beams, and that's a thing we didn't even get into trusses when we have shear and moment and axial forces. As much as we did an example with uh, a moment frame, um, that was beyond what I was asking of you guys for this. If you drew it as a UDL, that was okay, as long as you kind of made your life easier by an analyzing it this way, which most of, most of you did, I think. Uh, so just to kind of help myself keep track, I, I, this was the tributary area for all of the pink ones. Luckily, all of these had the exact same tributary area and all of the same loads on it. Um, so I was able to... Um, uh, figure out what the the PF or the factored load for all of the pink spots were and the factored load for all of the green spots. Um, uh, so I multiplied my dead load factor times my dead load plus my live load factor times my live load times my tributary area and I got my factored loads. I then drew my free body diagram. Here is my free body diagram. My reactions, if you drew in the calculated reactions, that is fantastic too. That is a solid win. But I didn't make you, I, I didn't take off points if you didn't draw in the reactions. But it is critical to say what the loads are. We want to know what these loads are. Um, if you just put P everywhere, less helpful. Um, uh, I was looking to see what those loads are. I, I wasn't too tough if you didn't. Um, dimensions are important, so we want to know how tall this is, and we know this is 12 bays of 2 meters, or a total of 24 meters. Where the loads are is important. A few people drew these loads hung from the underside of the truss. Can anyone think what impact that might have? Let's look at this condition right here. If we draw this cut right here, we can pretty much figure out that this post is going to be in compression. If I drew this hanging from the underside, well, it's right there in the word, hanging, hanger, this element is going to be in tension, not necessarily in compression. So where it's applied is very, very, very important. We need to know where that's being applied. So um, making sure you apply it at the top is very important because the top cord is what's supporting the deck. You've, you've all been in buildings where you've seen the rest of the truss underneath and then the decking loading up the top. Now I'm not going to go through all the truss because this would take a very long time um, and we've done a bunch of those in Structures 1. Um, for anyone who wants, go back and watch some of the videos in Structures 1 where we analyze a truss. I know there's a few of you who didn't do Structures 1 with us go back and find those videos in my channel on YouTube and you can find all of those calculations. If you just want a quick refresher, feel free to go back and take a look at those. But this is where I'd probably label all the members and nodes so that I had something to keep track with. I'd find the reactions and I'd make a series of free body diagrams, partial free body diagrams, to solve for the internal axial forces in all the members. I recognize that this is a mirror of my truss, so I'd find all of these ones. It doesn't mean these ones don't exist, I'm just going to make my life easier and only solve for all of these ones, and point out that these ones are a mirror of it. It is highly important to track tension and compression. Remember I said positive and negative only tells us if we drew our arrows correctly, or if it, we draw everything in tension and we get a negative number, that means it's in compression. But you're the one that knows that because you're the one that made the official assumption or the original assumption. You have to let us know if it's in tension or compression. A positive and negative doesn't mean anything. It means they're opposite, but I don't know what you assumed you drew. 
This is really important in your axial force diagram. We need to say tension or compression here. So free body diagrams, um, a lot of people drew arrows to say what tension and compression was. Um, my examples, I did different hatching. Um, different colors are certainly, certainly a different handy way to do it. Um, uh, tension and compression doesn't mean much, uh, or sorry, positive and negative doesn't mean much. Um, this kind of helped see the numbers, but red is everything in compression and yellow is everything in tension. And I've said what my uh, units are here, but most importantly, I've said what the actual values are. We want to see what this is. But at a glance, I can see that my worst case axial loads are right here, which means I can zoom in and say, oh, that this member here has a, a 1,160 kilonewtons of compression in it. Um, uh, so when I go to size these, which we're not doing, I would know what this needed to satisfy. So we want to show tension and compression, whether we do it with C and T or whether we do it with colors. Um, as long as I understood what you were showing with the arrows, I was fine with it, but some people drew arrows going this way and this way, even for our diagonals and our posts. Um, I tried to be as friendly with points as I possibly could. Um, uh, so as long as you showed something, I tried to give as many marks as I possibly could. Um, so that is, let's, uh, come back to this. So you can see here, I've put all this in the slideshow for you. Um, so that more or less sums up what I wanted to do as a refresher. Uh, I used to have a different assignment for this course before it was on um, Quercus. So there is um, uh, another practice set of questions if you want to. There is one that is the King Post Trust that is similar to the King Post Trust question that was on the exam. So that's in the module folder as well. So uh, between this and um, uh, your assignment and your um, uh, the example problems that I've posted, you have a good selection of kind of refresher questions to go back and look at. Um, and like I said, feel free to go back and watch the YouTube videos from last term if you want to look for a few more kind of problem sets to solve. Um, it's probably helpful for you to understand the different types of strength failures. Similar to what we did last term, uh, you should have a general feel of a stiffness problem and a stability problem as well. Again, these are forever tips going out in the world. Um, for the course, yeah, you should probably have a quick feel of what a strength failure looks like, stiffness failure, and a stability failure look like. Again, those are hard to test on. Um, I more want you to be able to talk about it um, because it's not always clear. Sometimes it is a bit of a conversation or a process where one can lead into the other, and you'll see that in the assignment. Um, you should be able to recognize a factor of safety or a limit states design equation, uh, and you should be able to calculate allowable deflection. Plus, you should be able to do everything that we talked about from Structures 1. So that wraps up structure, the first course in Structures 2. I am very excited about the next lecture, which is uh, stress and strain. Um, it's an introduction of a new concept for a lot of you, um, but it's the one that starts getting us on the path to our answers. I'll be honest, the very first time I taught, uh, it was the very first lecture I, I taught, and I hated it. I loathed it. I was so upset. It doesn't help that, by mistake, drawing on the big projector, I circled a bunch of things and ended up, by mistake, drawing a very inappropriate diagram on a very large screen. Um, but once I recovered from that shame and embarrassment, um, I realized I just, um, uh, I hadn't been fully prepared for it. It was the very first class and the very first lecture I ever taught. Yes, I jumped in teaching structures too. Uh, now I can say I think it might be my absolute favorite lecture. So we're going to get to start that next week and we're going to start down the path of understanding materials and how they behave and how we finally get our answers in our members. So I'll see you guys next week.